Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Allie Wilbur, and I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin Visual Artists. The Wisconsin Visual Artists is an artist-run nonprofit organization that started in the year 1900 as the Society of Milwaukee Artists in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So for the past century, WVA has been dedicated to supporting visual artists working within the state. Today, I'm excited to present a discussion on how artists can be advocates for themselves as well as others through their artwork, actions, and organizations that they're involved with. WVA is partnering with Arts Wisconsin for this panel in honor of Creative Wisconsin Month. And representing Arts Wisconsin, we have Ann Katz moderating this discussion. Thank you, Ann. Um, a special thank you to Christine Style for sponsoring this program so that we can compensate our guests for their time and their thoughts. Please feel free to add any questions and we will address them before the end of the talk. Um, and Anne, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. I'm, I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say today. Thank, thank you. you, Allie, and thank you panelists. Um, I am also very pleased to be uh, that we're able to do this uh, conversation today. I'm Ann Katz. I'm director of Arts Wisconsin. We're the state's community cultural development organization. We haven't been around as long as Wisconsin visual artists, but we have been around for over 25 years advocating for everything connected with the arts and creativity in the state. Uh, and so we are a service organization, a resource organization, an advocacy organization, and we do our best to um, celebrate and uh, advance and activate the arts for everyone everywhere in the state. So Creative Wisconsin Month has been going on through the month of April. Uh, we have had a series of uh, really interesting conversations about everything from young arts leaders to fundraising, that's tomorrow. Um, we've had the um, Wisconsin Poet, Poet Laureate, Dasha Kelly Hamilton. She kicked off the month and um, we are very glad to be partnering with Wisconsin Visual Artists today to um, hear from these smart, uh, I'm creative, I'm sure opinionated people, and I mean that in the best sense of the word. So I'm gonna ask each panelist to each introduce themselves and then we'll go back to everybody so they can talk for a bit. I know we won't have time uh, to really do justice to all of you, but I, um, I'm glad that we are all together to, to be talking about artistry, advocacy, and um, the work that needs to be done. So um, we'll go quickly through the screen uh, and then we'll go back to Jenny. So Jenny, can you introduce yourself first? Oh. You're muted. Good catch, thanks. Uh, that's really funny. But yeah, so my name is Jenny Gao and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an artist and I run an anti-gentrification arts business out of Madison, Wisconsin. And I've been running my business now full time for almost seven years. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Katie, you're next. All right, uh, thanks Jenny for um, being the first to not on yourself. <laughs> uh, but my, my name is Katie Avila Lockmiller. Uh, I'm an artist uh, based in Milwaukee, almost five years now, which is a crazy, originally from Boston. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Luna, which is a Latina artist collective of, based in Milwaukee. I'm also part of a collective called Hurt Space. Um, and I am just, I, I joke and partially serious that I'm a co like serial collective creator. So I also started an organization slash collective called Milwaukee Action Intersection in response to um, the social uprising that happened after the murder of George Floyd last year. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> Stacy, you're next. Um, thank you. So my name is Stacey Burkhart. Uh, I am a textile artist. I'm based out of uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, but I live in the small town of Pulaski. So um, I'm also the founder of SAGE, which is an arts advocacy nonprofit. Um, we've been around the Green Bay area for about four years. Uh, we uh, facilitate as a nonprofit for the last two years, and we're really excited because I think we finally found uh, a location to call home um, and really begin working uh, more in the community. Great, very important, thank you. And Tina, you're, you are last but not least. 
Hi everyone, my name is Tina. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and he, him, his. I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist that's originally from South Carolina. Um, and I am an assistant and organizer for Freedom Inc., which is a Southeast Asian and Black um, organization here that provides support around domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, I'm also an arts envoy lead artist with artists working in education that's based in Milwaukee. Thank you. Well, all right, now we're gonna get to hear from all of you. Um, we had some questions that we tossed around for you to answer, but you all know how to talk, you're advocates, you know how to, to talk about the work and what you do. So I'll start, we'll start with Jenny. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, all right, so um, are we focusing first on the question about our backgrounds? Well, I, you know, we have, yeah. we have 10 minutes each okay. for each of you. And I think it's, or 10 to 15 minutes each, it's probably easier to sort of bundle all of you together than to just keep going around the screen. Okay. If that works. Yeah, okay. I, can, yeah. I didn't know which format you want to do, so thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I can, I'll, I'll start with a little bit about uh, my background. So on a personal level, I'm a second generation Taiwanese and Chinese American. Um, I have roots in Taiwan for my mom's side and Shanxi and Southern Mongolia on my dad's side. And I grew up in rural Kansas. So between my Taiwanese and Chinese roots uh, within the family and then between my Asian household and rural Kansas, I'm very familiar with being in, in polarized spaces. And I have also always had an up close view of people's labor. My parents uh, used to own a takeout restaurant when I was a kid and I spent a lot of time uh, in the restaurant until closing time and that, that was all during my formative years. Um, and professionally, um, in terms of my own labor, um, I've also been working since I was 17 and so I'm 33 now and it's weird to think that I've been working for almost half of my life and I used to hide that information um, being from older people because I, I found that a lot of them would be impressed until impressed with my experience until they found out I was young. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, so I've thought about that in terms of just like, like how like that, sh that has shaped my, uh, my understanding of labor from my family to my professional background. Um, but that I've, I've held a lot of jobs across industries, um, that have given me, um, kind of like a full spectrum picture of how all of these different fields uh, play together in an ecosystem. And so I was a floor manager at an art museum, um, and that was where I cut my teeth learning how to write best practices and training curriculum for staff. I was specifically working with the security staff, and so it's the people who are, who are actually running the spaces, working behind the scenes, and making sure everything stays safe. Uh, I worked as an art program specialist in Milwaukee, uh, in the Milwaukee public school system, and I was there during Act 10. Uh, and so I was working at a school with predominantly students of color um, and witnessed firsthand what happened when the public school system uh, decided to cut funds and well, they didn't decide to cut the funds, but how they then decided to divvy up the funds after the budget cut statewide. Um, but how at the wealthier suburban, predominantly white schools, they preserved the arts because art was seen as a path to enlightenment uh, and then by contrast, cut the arts at schools like mine because art was seen as a path to poverty for kids who are poor. Um, and, and after that, I worked at, uh, in, in the manufacturing world um, and, and specifically uh, building training for job mobility uh, within the company and ways to reduce waste and improve workflows and, and make the workspace more safe for people. And I saw that pipeline between the students that I worked with in the school and then where people end up um, in, in the work environment and what opportunities they have. And, and at the crux of all of these different experiences that I had with labor, uh, I, what, I, what I found repeatedly affirmed was that um, people's access to creative autonomy and ownership of, of what we do and who we are is critical. It's absolutely critical to our well-being. It's absolutely critical to our power and influence in this society. Uh, and so that's what ultimately pushed me to quit my corporate job. Uh, and after all of my many jobs before, uh, before that, uh, to start my own business and to center uh, specifically on the arts and, and what art can do to change ecosystems and communities. Um, and so now, now I've been running my business for seven years, and um, and I would say like my business primarily operates in in three streams. Um, I provide 
creative direction services and create art commissions. I have an e-commerce store where I sell original artworks, prints, and arts licensing. And I consult for cultural organizations in best practices centered on equity. Um, and in each of these channels that I work in, I strive to, one, properly value my own labor and other people's labor uh, so that I can be building my own wealth and also redistribute money to people, causes, and businesses that I believe in. Um, I, two, create projects that not only benefit who I am as an artist, but also the surrounding community that will live with the work long term. Uh, and three, build best practices that are equitable and remove systemic barriers in the process. And, and my hope is that any of the organizations that I work with will be easier to work with for the next artist, BIPOC, or historically excluded person that comes in after me. Um, and, and that's something that, um, that I hold close, just what we do to make sure that, that those who come after us um, have, have, better, have it better um, and, and don't face the same difficulties. Um, I've worked with and helped to found a number of organizations in Wisconsin. Um, I, I was a founding member of Dane Arts Mural Arts and Artlet Lab in Madison, both of which continue to do important work in this community. Um, and one of the things that I found has shifted um, over, over these years that, that I've been working um, is that while I'm proud of the work that I've done at each of these organizations and the spaces that I've occupied. Um, I also realized at a certain point um, that as a woman of color in this community, um, like this community won't ask women of color to stop volunteering their time. Um, and, and it'll like it, it'll run you to the ground um, uh, if, if, it, if you let it take advantage of your time. And so one of the fundamental shifts for me, particularly in the last few years, um, has been to ask the question, where can I be the most impactful with my time? Um, and how do any of us live like the future you want is already here? And so you, you think about a city like Madison, Wisconsin in particular, uh, where we have more nonprofits per capita than any other American city. And somehow we are still one of the most segregated and inequitable cities in the nation. And you know, all this fighting for equity is supposed to lead to equity, um, ideally within our lifetimes. And so that's one of the questions that, I, that um, that I really drive and that I try to answer for myself as a woman of color, as a second generation um, Asian American, and, um, and as the first person in my family to break a lot of cycles of intergenerational trauma and abuse. Um, and, and so just in terms of breaking those cycles, like what can we do? What can someone like me do to be living like the future we want is already here? And so that's, that's something that's become really fundamental to my practice, especially in the last few years. Uh, and you know, in terms of why I keep doing this work, uh, I've, I've become increasingly alarmed uh, by gentrification and particularly the role of the arts in it. Um, and particularly since uh, my school years, uh, when I was pursuing my own degree in the fine arts, I've heard so many people say that this is just the way it is, that artists and BIPOC and queer people make a place cool and vibrant and then it gets expensive and displaces everyone. And, and that resignation um, of, the, of so many artists, of so many arts professionals, of, um, of the field that this is just how it is, it's just unacceptable. Um, and all of these exploitative tropes are unacceptable. And so, uh, and so this, like, this has become like, like the main motivator uh, of, of the things that I'm building towards now as, um, as an artist and, and as, a, as a business owner. Um, I said earlier on that I, in my introduction that, uh, that I'm building an anti-gentrification arts business, that, that the things that I do as a practitioner have to combat and disrupt uh, these harms in, in our community. And so looking at the ways in which I'm structuring things like labor uh, labor and ownership in these projects um, and, and, and who it affects and who it includes. Um, and I do this work because what's done before us is neither equitable nor sustainable. And I also like challenging existing paradigms and disproving myths that uh, people like to uphold like they're facts. And yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's kind of that where, where I am today. Uh, yeah. 
Thank you. Very succinct. So much work. Thank you, Penny. Um, Katie, you're next. Well, it's hard to follow, uh, follow Jenny as I like start writing things down. I love, uh, I think Jenny, this is the first time we've been on the panel together and I'm very excited, but I have, I have plenty of conversations, uh, lots and lots of conversations about this with Jenny and um, like half of what I do and how I think about things uh, is totally accredited. To, to Jenny and the, and the work that she does and the way that she inspires uh, me and I brought her into classes. I also teach and have brought her into classes. And um, so I'm like, I'm still like, oh, I want to ponder that more, but uh, to get to me, I guess. Um, and, I, and I also thank Jenny for sort of leading with like her background and, and like having that be a, so much a part of the story and influence and, and kind of encouraging others to think the same. Um, I also do that a lot and so I will start kind of with my background as well um, because it is very influential in how I think about things and how I see the world and, and see my work. Um, so I um, was born in Colombia and I was adopted and I was adopt and I grew up um, with a white family, a predominant white community and I think that really living in that in that world and not really seeing representation at that young of age it did have an effect i didn't have the words or um yeah the words or to, to talk about it or to think about it but it did have detrimental effects as i was a student and as i was a young person trying to figure out who and what i was supposed to be doing and so um you know and then but arts was always sort of at the core and i you know went i went to public school um just south of boston and, and a, city called Quincy and luckily had a really, really robust random art program. Um, so that was sort of my saving grace through while I was trying to process all these things I didn't have any words to articulate um, my experiences with. So um, kind of flash forward and I was really interested in education and also in um, change at both a local and national level. So I got into nonprofit work but um, and when I pretty, I'd say what in my mid twenties, realized that arts were missing from some of these really great social change organizations that I got to work with or learn from. And I always had an issue with that. So I ended up going to school at Otis College of Art and Design to pursue my master's of fine arts and art and public practice so that I could be, um, make sure that arts were a part of any social change that I was going to to be involved in in the future. And so uh, then I found myself, and after being on the East Coast and then going West Coast, I found myself in the middle of the country in Milwaukee five years ago um, and started, and that's where actually I met Jenny pretty early on um, and started working directly with you know, artists and really great artists and, and community members and figuring figuring things out. And what I noticed really, really, really on, early on was um, a representation problem. I was working for an organization that was trying to hire artists to work with uh, students, almost, almost all students of color. Um, and then the artist list that they had to choose from were all white. And I was like, this is ridiculous. This is not okay. This, I didn't want to perpetuate what I was like the kind of uh, what I was raised with. So I made it an effort to, to, uh, to change that and also um, to figure out specifically where Latinx artists were because while, there, while it was dismal across the board in terms of representation of anyone who was non-white, um, I, I really, for me, obviously being Latinx and that was important to me, but also so I just didn't see that, that, that population represented in the way that I wanted to, particularly knowing the numbers of Milwaukee. Um, so I, um, so yeah, so that's why I founded Luna. I um, asked my my colleague who was at the time who was seeing the same issue and asked, and she was also Latina. And so I asked her, you know, who, where uh, are there other Latinx artists? Like, I don't know. And she, be, being from Milwaukee, uh, was able to gather a bunch of bunch of lists of people that she knew and that's how Luna was formed and it's constantly ch changing and growing and that was about four years ago so um yeah so it's and it's been a really exciting journey to uh ha to figure out what Luna is what it can be um and what it's not and where it's um 
where we need to continue to grow and but to also to to carve out our own spaces to hold our own exhibitions to do it in our way and to um, and not wait for doors to be open to but like to open those doors and then also get people to think about that um, so for, that's cons we're you know we're consistently trying to or I'm and I'm consistently trying to ensure that uh, these artists that, that are part of the collective are you know are able to have access to opportunities because I think that is another thing. Um, so you know, early on, I was like, I, I don't, you know, actually the organization I work for, I did approach them and said, you know, what is the deal with this discrepancy in representation and who you're serving? And they plainly told me that they don't apply for these things, and I that was an unacceptable answer for me. And so I. Um, and also very othering and very problematic in lots of other ways. So just trying to change it. So at least if there's like now, there's no one in Milwaukee who can't say, where do I start to find Latinx artists? Not that we represent the totality of the, the art that community, but it's a start. And I think that is important. And I think that that is, that's why I really, really love collectives because you can ignore one or two people, but you can't ignore a group. Um, and so I guess we'll talk about my other, Collective herd space, which is like kind of the same thing. We're a women of color led and focused performance group. Um, we really trying to make you know our like performance more accept uh, uh, to perform and write the things that we want to perform and write, and also creates hold space. Um, I don't want to. I'm trying to move away from then create space. We're going to hold space for others to to do the same. So um, very similar. The group sort of evolved around the same time as Luna, and actually a lot of the uh, there's two people in Luna, or there's one other person, including myself, in Herdspace who's also in Luna. So we kind of operate in similar, just like different visual arts and then kind of the performing arts as well. Um, but then, of course, like everything, things kind of shifted for me in the last year, like it did for everybody. Um, and so advocacy and um, has been really important. I, I like to mention Milwaukee Action Intersection, even though it's not arts focused. For me, I don't ever approach, I can't approach art without thinking about, you know, equity and um, representation and advocacy. And I can't really approach anything else I do without thinking about how do the arts play a role. So Milwaukee Action Intersection is a really great, uh, we're an organization that came together, like I said, after, um, you know, I think a week or so of protesting, trying to figure out how could we be something different? How could we support protesters? How could we support a, the long-term strategic effort that we need to figure out our racism problem? How do we dismantle and just demolish white supremacy? How do we do that? And not that we figured it out, but um, we're working on it. And so I think that is, um, and other things go hand in hand. And I mean, one of our efforts that we, for the last six months, we're really focused on was our AMP the Vote effort, which was talking about the elections, um, but also making elections, not just like getting people to like know how to vote or how to register or where to vote and all that and who they're voting for, because we also worked a lot on um, the local elections to like get out information about candidates, but also to like celebrate voting. So for the both the primaries, or, or no, sorry, both the general election in Wisconsin that just happened in Milwaukee that just happened a couple of weeks ago, but also in November, the large the large election, a lot of people cared a little more about, um, we had DJs at the polls and that was really important to like celebrate. And that for me is like how to creating those events, that is an art to me. Um, so that's how I sort of approach that work as well. And I think artists, um, you know, similar to what Jenny said about, you know, that Art, art and creativity just has holds a lot of power and and ho has always been a part of our social change movements so i think it's um it, it is imperative that artists have a seat at the table uh, artists are creative we're problem solvers we're creative thinkers we um you know there's never a project i say no to or never because <laughs> i'll just figure it out um and so i think that and i think that is the same like i love working with other artists as well particularly collaboratively and again that's why i love collectives because you know you put a few artists in, in a room and we'll have like one small idea will turn into something bigger and we can tackle more so i think artists need to have a, a not just a seat at a table, but a leadership position in anything that is um, going to move the needle forward. So, 
hopefully I answered all the, I don't know, all the questions in there, but. Ooh, Anne, I think you're muted now. Always happens. Um, uh, I'm writing down line, I'm not writing down some of your statements. I, you know, I wrote down live as if the future is already here. Jenny, I'm going to totally use that. And then when you said, uh, Katie, um, you can, uh, people can ignore one or two other people, but they can't ignore a group. Uh, there, there is strength in numbers. And so the more that we um, come together, the better. So thank you for that. <clears throat> Stacy, you are next. Wow, like so much yes to everything that I've heard so far. It's so inspiring. Um, it's taking me back to when uh, our organization used to actually be able to have meetings together and in person. You just always came away so inspired and so uplifted. So um, thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, my name is Stacey Burkhart. I am a textile artist. Um, my personal story, um, I give my grandmother like all the credit in the world for, for making me who I am today. Um, she sat me down at a sewing machine when I was six years old and the rest is you know history. But looking back, she was a huge Bob Ross fan as well. So when my mom was at school um, as a single mom going back to be a nurse, grandma and I watched soap operas and Bob Ross. So, um, but you know, for me, what I learned um, early on was how much I, I love being creative and, uh, I grew up in private school and college. You know, it was something that you went to. It wasn't an option. Um, I started off as uh, an English major, and I wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to be able to have a voice and 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 share my opinions. And that didn't get me. It <laughs> didn't get me very far. And I switched and I became a, a psychology major because suddenly people fascinated me. Sociology, psychology, the way things function, uh, you know, how people live in this world. And um, I then took a job in food service and hospitality. And I think it turned a few heads in, in my immediate family because why did you go to college for a psychology degree only to be slinging pizzas in a restaurant? And for me, I felt like I used it every day because I was always interacting with others. I was always conscious of what my interactions were. And I was, I was always just, just aware. There was that additional awareness uh, within what I was doing. Uh, in 2010, I took a position as a events manager at a really high class resort in Southern Indiana. And that was a, a turning point for me because at, the, at that juncture in my life. I was single. I was alone. It was just me and my dog. And I would work 60, 70 hours. I would work until 2 a.m. I would work, you know, every single weekend. I had no social life, but it was okay because it was just me. And I, I didn't think anything of it. I, I thought to myself, this is what I have to do in order to succeed at this job. And eventually with working in, in special events, here comes my creativity. Here comes an opportunity for me to sit at a table and present new ideas and, and different ways of going about things. And I was dismissed. I sat at that table full of men, to be frank, and, and every idea of, well, why don't we try it this way? Or how about instead of doing it you know, the way we've always done it, we go about this route or whatever, however you want to look at it every time. Dismiss, dismiss, dismiss. And my job was leading me absolutely nowhere. My creativity was being stifled because my position was defined for me as were my expectations. Uh, in 2012, while I was working that job, I gave birth to my first daughter. And then I added another role to my life, which was mom. Um, and that, that 60, 70 hour work week didn't work anymore. And here I was, you know, taking then in order to assume that role, a pay cut <laughs> and a lesser position and the responsibilities, the, the majority of responsibilities that came with parenthood. And I hated it. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to put it. Um, I just felt trapped and, uh, 2014, brought me here to Wisconsin um, with twins. So I now had three girls. And 
I needed, I was staying home and I needed that sense of self again. I needed to get back to who is Stacy. And, and so I started a business and I sat back down at that sewing machine and I just started sewing the most simplest of things, which was burp claws and baby bibs and anything that my kids needed at that time. And, and it was fun because that was my only social interaction as far as I'm concerned. Um, three kids kept me very occupied. Um, and there's, there's a lot more to that story too. But um, moving and having three kids and being at home rather than working a career position and, and starting a business, it was just, there was a lot. And um, so that's where Sage came into play is because as an organization, we started um, just as a group of makers I started going to the farmer's market and I would introduce myself to people because I didn't know anybody. And and I would, you know, ask, where do you get this supply? I remember I met a gal that made lip balms and sold them at the farmer's market. And I made, at the time, um, those reusable beeswax food wraps. And I was like, where can I source beeswax in Wisconsin? You know, thinking that, that I'm gonna be all resourceful and, and support local. And so that struck up a conversation with her and, and Sage began then simply as a form of communication across a lot of folks that were working from home, that were trying to create legitimate businesses um, while working at home, that typically assumed an additional major role in life, whether it be parent, whether it be that they also worked a full-time job, but this, this making was their, their sense of self. Um, and... Uh, we just we just enjoyed each other's company and we would get together and we would talk about shows you know i guess that makes me a little bit different than the fine arts because i started in the craft world i started with high school <laughs> craft shows and complaining about direct sales being at the same event as i was because they were stealing all my customers and et cetera, et cetera, and and uh, but, you know, we built in Green Bay, we built a family. You know, we built that connection across people that wanted to take their passion and turn it into real work. That didn't want to sit in, in a corporate position. Um, one, of our, one of our best and greatest advocates and volunteers was Sage, um, worked at a bank until a year ago. And to, to see and to have known her as she's transitioned from full-time corporate to seeing who she is now as a full-time artist and maker, it's remarkable to me. Um, and and we, we talk over and over about how we'll never go back, <laughs> how, how we'll never let anyone take our creativity from us. Um, and so in 2019, Sage decided that we were doing so well as an organization and connecting so well within our within our own meetings that we wanted to take it further. We wanted to branch and go out into the community and we wanted to make a difference. We were really looking um, to have an impact and to make progress as it pertained to arts makers and creative opportunities. And so we formed as a nonprofit. Um, and shortly thereafter, one of our members I say the, t the term member loosely because we don't have a membership fee or anything like that. And people come and go as they, as they like. She said, she's, uh, she's amazing. She's a, an amazing artist. And um, she said, I'm really paying attention to the market and what's trending right now because I want to make sure I'm making something that sells. And it was just like, it hit me really hard because my advocacy lies in acknowledging that it's our individual creativities and our individual abilities, be them innate or learned, that not only make us who we are, but should be celebrated. Not what's trending in the market, not the, the color that Pantone decided was the best thing for you to be working with, but what you see and what you want to create. And so I, I, just said, I'm, I'm going after this. I'm advocating for this. I'm advocating for the space, the time, and the opportunity for an artist, maker, creative, what have you, to create in a way that best suits them as an individual. And so that's where we stand right now. Um, for 
I learned early on, I'm, I'm a stubborn individual <laughs> I, I, as it pertains to um, applying for grants, um, being a newer nonprofit, this wasn't an area that I was familiar with in the first place and it wasn't necessarily an area that our board, who is 100% artist, there's four board members and right now and we are all artists and creatives and this wasn't something that we were familiar or used to and so we, well we'll start applying for grants we'll, we'll start putting ourselves out there with these ideas and concepts we're sorry we're sorry we're sorry and nothing not a grant in sight so we're like how do we do this <laughs> how do we function on on no budget and i was the, the person I, i've never been a fan of just taking money I've never been, a, a, if, if someone's going to contribute to our cause and, and what we're doing, I want, whether it be that you feel a, a purpose driven in that contribution, whether it be that you receive something like a tangible, um, whether it be that we did a, a run of art prints or something like that. I want that when we're receiving money that, that you, whoever is contributing, feels like they're a part of what it is that we're doing. And so we made the determination as of this year to function as a self-funded nonprofit. Um, and so we operate completely on programs that, uh, you know, uplift the artists, give the artists an opportunity to showcase their work. Um, we operate on a shoestring budget <laughs> in order to make that happen. Um, but we've, we've facilitated programs here in the Green Bay area that really, I believe, the artists that choose to participate feel like they are directly contributing to the success of their community. Um, there, we have the gallery program where artists um, have the opportunity to be partnered with um, a locally owned small business and we hang their artwork in these small businesses and then we showcase um, both the business and the artist. And that's been a really be it, you know a small program uh, an amazing program because there's that connection that's established um, across both the small business owner and the artist um, we do fun programs like artist trading cards um, where you can submit to participate and the uh, the artists just make little little cards tiny pieces of art and then we share them with each other these were all programs that we developed during the pandemic in order to continue while being socially isolated or unable to gather um, as a group and it's been awesome um we we look at 2020 and we say man you know we really grew and and uh, I, I i guess that's that's a big thing for me right now is providing the artists and creatives in the Green Bay area with the space, materials, you know, and if I can, even the time to create. Um, so we have two programs. One is called Creative Community. It's just a free open studio space. Um, people from the community can donate art supplies. Then artists and creatives from the community can come in, make use of those, um, and, and they just create. And from that, we also have a program called The Lab, which is a little art boutique. Um, right now it's an online store, but we're preparing to take it to um, in person in a brick and mortar location. And what the lab is, is taking that concept of, I have an idea, I don't know if it will sell, but it's something that I feel passionate about. It's an idea that's uniquely mine and I wanna create it and I wanna put it out there. And we say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna help make that happen. So we remove the barrier of cost associated with materials and investment, and we just say, take that idea and make it something. And it's been extremely rewarding. Why do I keep doing, doing what I'm doing um, when it's all volunteer? I've never, I've never been in a position where I felt like I carried more purpose amongst my peers than I do right now. And to maintain that feeling of, of, of intense purpose with others in my community, I, 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 I will continue to volunteer in, in order for, to see other people's success. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. Oh, thank you, Stacy. Mm. Again, I'm, this is, these are such rich conversations. Um, Tina, you are up. Hi, y'all. Um, can, can I get a thumbs up that y'all can hear me well? 
Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm really excited to be on this panel and it's so great to hear everyone's work. Um, um, <laughs> I think I have partial imposter syndrome because I'm like, what am I doing here with all these amazing people? Um, but yeah, thank y'all so much for what you put into the art world in Wisconsin and the communities around us. Um, so my background, I, I'm a baby artist. <laughs> I just graduated um, from school during the pandemic. Um, I was able to get my degree. And um, I'm originally from Summers in South Carolina. And so my work, where my passion, I guess, for um, servicing the community starts from a young age of just having an experience. So I'm from a really, really small town. If you look it up on Google Maps, Summerton, South Carolina, it's a really tiny town with a population under a thousand. Um, and it was actually the first, um, the first school district in the in the country to sue for segregated schools. Um, it's a case called the Levi Pearson case um, that later turned into the Brown versus Board of Education that then led to integration in the entire United States. And I, I'm bringing that up to say that our school, Scotch Branch High School, being the first school to lead integration in this country, um, you can't tell if you go into the city, into the town, because the town is very much still segregated to the point that white families purposely pay thousands of dollars a year for their students, their white kids to go to a private school so they don't share the same space as the students of color and mo majority, almost all black. Um, so my graduating class did not have any white students. Um, when I was in high school, there was only two, one, two white girls um, that was a part of a community center in town um, for younger moms. So they obviously were forced to go to public school. Um, so I I grew up um, with the privilege, and, and this is something I always tell people, with the privilege of figuring out who I am as a person before I figured out what society or what racism told me to be. So I did not realize um, the implications that Blackness held until I went to college. Um, and that's, that's something, like even now when I think about that, I'm so surprised that I was living in such a great space, <laughs> such a healing world of um, just being engulfed in Black culture um, and not knowing that a lot of that culture um, is um, inflicted or um, has a part in systematic racism. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm going three towns over to the um, to the grocery store to go shopping for my parents. And I'm really excited because I got my driver's license and I'm driving, not thinking at all about how um, redlining has affected the fact that we don't have grocery stores within 20 miles of my town. Um, and so, you know, it's like growing up without the trauma and then realizing what that trauma is later on in life. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like where my passion comes from. And I, I ended up going to a, f a few schools. I actually transferred to the school, the art school in Milwaukee, um, where I graduated from. Um, and there, I, I <laughs> so I pursued art because I got a scholarship, and that's really all. And you know, it, it's the it's the truth when it comes to when you go to low income communities, low income public schools. Talent is what get us to college. It's like really interesting to hear Stacy say um, that you know college is something that you're expected to do, and in my school, college is something that you're privileged to do, right? Like you you have some specific talent of art or dance or singing or football. That's basketball, and then you get to go to college, and everyone else um, stays in town or join the military. And so I was introduced to art my senior year in high school. I planned on joining the Navy, um, but they said, you're a good painter. And they gave me a scholarship to go to school. Um, and I was like, oh, this is money <laughs> to do something other than be scared. In the, the thought of the military really scared me. But I was just I was just like, what's my only option? You know, I don't want to be low income for the rest of my life. So I got this option to go to school and I took it. And, and the school that I originally went to was a predominantly white school that did not service me. I mean, Myad um, is still a predominantly white school that in some ways did not service me as well. Um, but I transferred to Milwaukee on a whim, like last minute thought. Um, and I, I, I came here and I'm sure Jenny and Katie can speak on this. The first thing you know that white institutions and white art institutions really push on you is representation. Your work is about representation. They place you in a box of make work 
um, representing your life and the, the community you're a part of. And um, even now there's a lot of conversations of like, I wanna make representative, representative work about, about people who are invisible. And I think when I was um, in my junior year of college, I really pushed back on this idea of representation because representation to who? Um, visible to who? And that that's something that I, um, that kind of put me in a roadblock because all of my work was about representing my queer black Asian self. And then I'm at this space and I'm like, but, but everyone sees me, you know, like you can turn on the TV and you can understand what's going on in the country right now, as far as black trauma and Asian trauma. Like I don't need to make a painting about that trauma. You know, you, you, it, so the representation dialogue and conversation became this really harmful thing to me because it, it was constantly, um, engaging in conversation with folks who um, are oppressive to convince them not to be oppressive anymore. And that's something that I refuse to be engaged with, right? I don't want to be involved with um, a conversation where I have to constantly ask for livelihood from folks in power. And that's where representation art set for me in this space where I'm representing something that they can easily just go outside or go to the north side of Milwaukee and see, right? Why do they need me to stay, come to the third ward and show them what the north side of Milwaukee looks like? They can go there and see it themselves. Um, so that's that's kind of like when the the um my work really transitioned and it transitioned into the into the space of talking about my own personal life um and my own personal trauma so i'm a survivor of assault and child abuse and a lot of my work is centered around this conversation um but it's not in uh, and this is going to sound so funny but it's not to raise a conversation again about sexual assault because we know the statistics of sexual assault we know the statistics of brown girls being assaulted and um being hurt and their their um how they're more vulnerable to violence we already know that everyone knows that you can turn on the tv and see that they make netflix shows about it so um even then the work isn't even about oh, this is what happened to me is more so about, this is um, a space I wanna hold for all of us to talk about our experiences to each other outside of the white gaze and outside of the, um, the implications that's placed on us to constantly ask for a right to livelihood. So, um, so <laughs> I went into college, um, my last two years of college, really working on that, really making work that I would sit and critique. A lot of my stuff is with Kanaka long hair and I will sit and critique and people will automatically say, this is about black womanhood, right? And I will first push back and saying I don't identify as a woman, so that's that's not right. Um, and secondly, that anybody ever asked, you know, white women artists is their work about white women womanhood, right? People constantly brought up the Kanakalon hair saying it's connected to blackness, which it in inherently is, but it's also a material that I um, have access to. It's also material that I have access to because I'm black. So yeah, it's inherently connected to blackness, but no one ever asked Eva Hess, is her hardware connected to whiteness? And so um, those are things that I really in, um, I really think about a lot in my work, in my practice. And then when COVID hit, <laughs> when coronavirus hit, um, the world went into chaos. And I complete, I saw the world start to transition, or I'm gonna just talk specifically about the United States. The United States start to transition in a space where um, it became accommodating. And it became accommodating to those who were white. And that was an issue to me. So for instance, a lot of schools said, um, this is a pass fail semester. Everyone, you know, it's just pass and fail. Your grade won't matter if you don't want it to. Um, and that was an issue for me because uh, they said that a lot of schools made statements saying it's because of the social economic issues people were having right now, uh, because of the widespread disease that was having that was happening right now, because of homelessness that was happening. Not everyone's thinking are these things that our students of color deal with already. Right. I worked four jobs in one semester with 19 credit hours because I was dealing with social social economic issues. But it took a coronavirus. It took a pandemic and it took white students to have to experience that social economic issue for then them to start setting boundaries and accommodations. Right. Work from home has always been obviously we're all witnessing something that's accessible to all of us. But people who are differently and di differently abled and disabled have been asking for it for years. And it's something that no one wanted to give accommodations for. It's not reasonable. Um, so these are all things that coronavirus really, um, it really made me sit down and ask myself, 
what work am I making right now in my art practice? What work am I making um, to really combat the state of this this country, this this systematic oppression that's happening everywhere? And um, then I, I don't know if you're all familiar with the book Parable of the Sower, but in this time period, which it, I don't recommend it during the beginning of the pandemic to read Parable of the Sower because it's a very traumatic book by Octavia Butler. But during that time, I was reading it. And um, there's this one part in the book that talks about making space for survival, holding space for survival. The entire book is about the world is ending and the world isn't really ending. It's just um, capitalism has seceded, and now we have to make space to survive. And I wonder, am I holding space in my artistry for survival, um, not for representation, not so that people can um, come and look at my work and kind of praise me, um, that people can come and question art theory, but how does this work stand in a state of survival? And I realized that my work didn't. That was a critique that I had to sit with myself and realize my work was not for the state of survival. It was just for, um, for me. And, and that's something that I grappled with the most of the summer during the George Floyd um, protest. I decided to stop making art. I volunteered as a medic during most of the protests in South Carolina. Then I moved to Madison. I came to a multiple protest here. And then I found myself at Freedom Inc. And I think that was so amazing about the organization Freedom Inc. is that it's this space of survival. They hold space for survival, for survival, survivors, for people that still consider themselves victims. And so this is an organization that is Southeast Asian and black led where um, they provide culturally specific services to survivors and victims of sexual assault, um, assault gender-based violence and um, intimate partner violence. And I work mostly with the queer justice team, um, thinking of events, um, programming that can really provide survival support for queer folks in the Madison um, and Wisconsin, in Madison area and throughout Wisconsin. And um, even now, I, I don't really have great, I mean, I'm a baby artist again, but I don't have great answers to how am I making space for survival in my work. I just realized that there was, there was advocacy while I'm grappling with this idea of what can I do next as an artist, there was still stuff going on. There was still trauma happening and there was advocacy and a requirement of me to join that work and that movement. And that's what I decided to do. Um, and then we all know that, you know, art can be healing and art makes community and art brings people together. And then we see these beautiful, um, bold statements on streets across this country um, of people saying Black Lives Matter, defund the police, defend Black women. Um, and we really get to see how art works and function in movement work um, and how people really can make um major conversations with visual aesthetics. And that's something that I uh, I, I think is so beautiful um, and so inspiring for me. Um, and then it also really brings this conversation of decolonizing design, which I think is something that we watched happen over the summer with um, just, you know, folks that have never taken design classes, never been a part of design aesthetics or theory, um, pick up paintbrushes and make their own um, decolonial designs. And I think that that's something that really, you know, it it causes art to be this thing that's accessible to everyone and not just the select few, even myself, that are privileged to go to art school. And I think that that's something that we watched happen over the summer that was quite amazing. Um, so yeah, it's, <laughs> I wish I had like a long, um, I wish I had like a long, um, story like everyone else has um because everyone here is so amazing but yeah i'm i'm just i'm really happy to be here and i'm really um happy to um be a part of this space and learn so much from you all and i think um someone who is just joining just being the person that y'all younger selves were is really excited to see what my future might hold um but yeah i think that this year has taught us a lot. It's taught me a lot and it's shown us a lot. And um, panels like this is important. Conversations like this is important and leaders like us are important because um, we really need to have the analysis and the, um, to be at the table and to flip the table over. So not even sit at the leaderboard table, but flip it over um, and say like enough is enough, right? That, that we watched over the year, we watched the entire year 
people make so many changes for the sake of upper middle class folks, even though lower class folks have been struggling, have been, uh, the pandemic has already happened <laughs> for a long time. You know, summers in South Carolina, they already had a pandemic. Indigenous people already went through an apocalypse. You know, Asian immigrants, they already dealt with so much apocalyptic situations. And it is it's really ridiculous that it takes um, white folks to have to um, be a part of the trauma for, all of us to um for all of us to stop and say hey we might need the help so yeah so i'm just here for space for survival advocating for spaces of survival holding spaces for survival and believing that art can really be for the sake of survival thank you tina i'm totally going to use that let's flip the table over idea um and your story is great thank you for telling it um Thank you all for telling your stories. You know, we have five minutes left, so um, there's lots we could go on. Maybe we should have a follow-up after this, but um, one of the questions, this is kind of a logistics question, but um, I'm sure that people will want to get in touch with all of you to talk about your work, your organizations, your art, every, your act, advocacy. So um, just to let people know who are listening, we'll ask each of you for a way that people can get in touch with you and then we'll put that on WVA and Arts Wisconsin's website because uh, I'm sure there will be questions and, and comments. Um, I guess in the, the few minutes we have, in the four minutes we have left, maybe we can go around the, the screen again and, um, uh, you know, is there, a, is there a statement that you wanna leave everyone with? You've already told your stories very succinctly and, and beautifully, um, but, is there something that you didn't get to say that you want to kind of sum up um, this, this presentation? So we'll start with Jenny. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think the statement that I'll end with is for us to get increasingly better, better every day at asking who all of this actually benefits. Who, who does this benefit? Who are we centering in these conversations? This is true of the race conversations that we need to have. This is, this is true of the gender conversations that we need to have, the socioeconomic conversations that we need to have. Specifically, since like this is an artist panel, uh, one of the things that I've been saying a lot to folks lately is that in the arts, arts professionals wax on and on about how the arts are important for economic impact and how good we are for economic development. Why is economic development good for us? Why is economic development good for us? Because if we can't answer that question, then it doesn't matter if we're good for economic development. We don't need to center economic development in the work that we do, right? Like, why is it good for us? Why, why do the cities that we come to deserve our labor? Why do the organizations that we come to deserve our labor? And if we can reframe the question like that, now we've got, now we've got a place where we can do real work. Great, thank you. Katie. Yeah, yeah. I um, totally agree with Jenny. And also I just want to say, Tina, you, yeah, I still suffer from imposter syndrome. So hopefully we can all figure out how to not uh, play into that. But you deserve to be here more than any of us. And I was very excited to have you. I, I've been seeing you, you've been out here doing the work and I am so glad to meet you all through this panel, um, but knew your name um, before uh, before this and excited to hear more of your story and where you're, where you're at. And I'm excited that you are young and you have so much I sometimes I'm not I am not old, but I often say like it's your turn uh, to, to anyone who's like ten years or more younger than me. So I'm excited that you are figuring it out, and I am learning. I would just thank you for sharing your thoughts. I just learned so much from you um, as well that I'm going to take with me, and um, and so I'm glad everyone watching uh, were able to hear that uh, hear that. So uh, but I just wanted to say you deserve to be here more than. In, in addition to all of us, we all deserve to be here. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I don't know if I have any like, golden thoughts, uh, but I, I'm thinking, uh, but what I guess that even what I'm hearing uh, from everyone is thinking just, I've been thinking a lot about self-care right now. Um, and I think, you know, and I'm particularly thinking last year, I thought a lot about labor and, um, and, the, and the idea of like being compensated and paying artists and making sure that um, we're being, 
intentional about who we're hiring and why we're hiring and how much we're paying um, and who gets jobs and who doesn't get jobs, um, particularly in the art world. Um, and who were who yeah who were consistently lifting up and who were consistently leaving out, um, but this year I think that I'm also thinking about I'm I'm, I'm shifting to self care and how important that is and how important it is that we all make that a part of our practice as well and that we pay for that too um, and, and that um, and that we um, and I think that that is like a key to you know, you know, making art and also, yeah, I think of going, making art for, that is about, I love the idea of making art for survival. And I think that is tied to self-care in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I never thought of it like that. So thank you for that new framing. Um, but like thinking about how we, how we take care of those girls, how, yeah, we don't like perform our identities for anyone else. Um, and we, we, we kind of take those moments to look inward and aren't also aren't don't have to constantly produce, which I think goes back to like ensuring that people are paid the way that they need to be paid and are, um, and that we are, and I think the one, um, and I also just so, so, so believe in collaboration. Um, so any, but of course, anyone on this panel, um, but also everyone else who's listening, um, we, um, yeah, we'll share contact information, but I want to continue to to talk and strategize and collaborate because I think um, when we work together, that is a really great way to um, take, do it so that like our, our workload is less. Um, I think with Milwaukee Action Intersection, one of the best things that I learned is that like when I don't go to meetings, nothing falls apart, right? So they, they just keep on meeting and the work keeps on going and that goes with everybody in the group. And that is a silly thing to say, but it, it's um, we need to remember that we're a team and that people can take breaks and come back in. And um, another big part of it is too that I think that one of the biggest tools of white supremacy is competition and that like our and artists are like uh always kind of we just like are taught that like it's a competition and like there's only room for like some of us but there's room for all of us and we should um yeah we just need to continue to reach out and build connections and build a bigger network so and that's also why i'm like really excited um to be on this panel too where it's mostly you know based on madison i think that there's like madison is so close after living in la madison and is like uh, like basically next is so close to Milwaukee, so we should all be collaborating way more. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Katie. Okay, Stacy, summing up. Summing up, um, I, I think I'm going to continue with um, echoing the the economic conversation and and simply make the statement: know your worth. Uh, a lot of what we are dealing with in the Green Bay area is a lack of proper compensation. Um, and, and that goes both ways, both um, with people that are making those decisions and, and putting the artistic jobs out there with um, inappropriate <laughs> pay, having a lack of understanding um, of what proper compensation looks like. And in the same regard, the artists that are so quick to jump at any and every opportunity just to get themselves out there. And, and I think that comes from um, me directly working with a lot of emerging artists um, that are so eager um, for the work that they're willing to take the lesser wage, but um, just know know your worth. And when we work together in that sense to, to provide a, a stable um, platform for artists to have a living wage, living wage for an artist <laughs> sometimes is, um, it is is mind blowing to me because we all we all should be deserving of that and and even for me and myself in my business I I, I deal with that and um, yeah that that's the only thing that I'm going to echo with the economics is know your worth. I'm going to slide back in for a second because I just want to tell you guys that I'm sitting back here smiling like a fool at my computer listening to all of you. Um, you're also incredibly intelligent and ambitious. Um, and passionate, and I'm so I don't you don't need me to be, but I'm so proud of all of you and the work that you're doing, and I'm so excited to see what you continue to do. Um, and honestly, the comments section, I've been looking to see if there's questions for you. There's no questions. No one's questioning anything that any of you are saying. They're all just <laughs> loving it and and taking it with them, and hopefully they'll be thinking about it for quite a while, um, and, and maybe it will leak into their personal practices a little bit. 
Um, maybe some collaborations will come out of this conversation. I'm really excited that I was able to have all of you um, a part of this panel today. And I hope that everyone listening and watching and people who will watch this later um, take a lot from, from this conversation, but also the knowledge that they have the agency to change their communities and challenge the status quo um, through individual art practices, but also that there's a rich um, variety of, of um, organizations and communities throughout the state that everyone can be involved with. Are there any final uh, final thoughts? Well, actually, yeah, we, we want to make sure Tina. We want to make sure Tina has a chance to sum up as well. Oh my God, Tina! Oh, I also wanted to say, <laughs> Tina, I had this written down. No <laughs> imposter syndrome. Oh my God, not at all. You're amazing. <laughs> Everyone here, amazing. Thank you. Um, I honestly <laughs> don't have too much to say. Um, I think my biggest thing is that we all have a responsibility to do the work and. Um, I'm talking about like the actual go out, actually get out your house, <laughs> go into the streets and do the actual work that takes up your whole weekend, that makes you miss out on morning coffees and brunch. Like, do people are, the state of our country is awful, but people are really suffering. Um, and we all, every single one of us, including myself, we all have a responsibility um, to help those most vulnerable. Um, and also, yeah, we all need to do that work and keep our analysis up. Um, don't go into spaces and just make them more unsafe. So that's just my biggest thing. Um, I'm also always here. I will love collaborating. <laughs> I'm also here to just have deeper conversations with anyone who's interested um, and also to learn more from others as well. I'm always here to listen and learn too. So thank you all so much for having me here. And thank you so much for the validation. Um, yeah. Okay, you guys, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, or I'm definitely thinking, um, as are we all. So uh, thank you, Ali, for the partnership with WVA. Thank you, all of our panelists, for your really heartfelt and important stories. There are no imposters here in any sort of way. Um, and this information, all of uh, the recording will be up on our website and social media, your website and social media and we'll get your contact information that you want to share so people can continue the conversation after this. So thank you all. It's uh, really glad we were able to do this. So thank you and keep your keep up the good work. Yeah, we're hoping to all host right. a few more panels like this. So follow uh, yeah. Wisconsin Visual Artists and follow Arts Wisconsin and um, stay up to date on everything that we're doing. Thank you all again for your for your words. Thanks.